Amen. Thank you, uh, Reverend Paulette, for leading us in our scripture reading today as we consider the first eight verses of Psalm 78. I want to use these words for our title today, Lest We Forget. Lest We Forget. Thank you all for your prayers. I certainly appreciate it. And um, my surgery will be 11 o'clock on Tuesday morning. So uh, set your timer on your phone. And all you have to say is in the name of Jesus. And that will be sufficient. Amen. I am deeply offended and concerned about the efforts that are underway in America to distort, to eliminate, to erase, and change America's history for political agendas. Politicians, you know the story, you've seen it like I have, are enacting legislation, policies, and practices that will not allow our true, comprehensive history to be taught in our schools. It's good to see our member, State Representative Cole here. She's been fighting that battle and we'll maybe be in another session uh, trying to be worn down for again a political agenda in states like Texas and Florida political leaders and others are prescribing how Teachers can talk in the classroom about current events and America's history of racism. They don't want to remember or talk about the bad parts of our history. A recent news article I read said that in the midst of this, Movement, perhaps I should say, not just efforts, but a movement that members of black churches in Florida have developed a resource kit in order to teach black history in the church. They are saying, quote, we will teach our own history. Marcus, Marcus Garvey reminds us and says that a people without knowledge of their history, their origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. Maya Angelou says, the more you know about your history, the more liberated you are. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. says, we are not makers of history, but we are made by history. Then historian David McCullough says, history is who we are and why we are the way we are. Not surprisingly then, what I would call mangled history makes mangled people who will not know who they are or why they are the way they are. So true for America. Perhaps that was a concern of James Weldon Johnson 
When he wrote the poem that became the song we referred to when I was growing up as a National Negro hymn, when he had it sung in February of 1900, lift every voice and sing, as they were celebrating in Jacksonville, Florida, the birthday of Abraham Lincoln. It was the first time it was publicly performed, and he had a group of 500 school children at the Stanton School in Jacksonville to sing his poem, the melody of which was written by his brother James. Perhaps he was thinking about this, lest we forget history, when you hear the third stanza, when he says, lest our feet stray from the places where we met thee, God, lest our hearts drunk with the wine of the world we forget thee shadowed beneath thy hand. May we forever stand true to our God and true to our native hand. Land, lest we forget true to God. And so then we must know and we must learn from our history. But some of us, whether in the room or on live streaming, have no history with God. And therefore there is nothing to forget because we did not know. And then for some of us who have history with God, we have forgotten what the Lord done, done. done, done for us. God had, and, and I believe still has that same observation about his people and his story among his people. Here we are in this 78th Psalm written by Asaph, who was probably a contemporary of King David, when he wrote these words, and he says to us that God's people in every age must hand down the history and the understanding of God's works and God's mind and God's words so that the subsequent generations will remain faithful even when they are tempted by disobedience and ingratitude. If we really focused on how good God has been, we would not forget to celebrate him and to tell what it is that he has done. And so then, I believe this psalm is both praise and warning, reminding us that lest we forget, we must intentionally Teach God's sayings, God's stories, and God's salvation. This psalmist, Asaph, tells God's people to listen to the lessons from God's people who speak to us in the present from the past. Learning insights from God's sayings, God's stories, and God's salvation based upon them telling and teaching what the Lord did for them. Asaph had received these teachings from previous generations who had preserved not only orally, but in some cases even written down what God had done, what God had said, how he had saved them. And then in this psalm, he sees that God has commanded us. He has commanded his people to pass on his sayings, his stories, and his salvation to those other generations. He wants us to teach in such a way that the history of God's people can be seen 
from God's perspective. See, sometimes history is distorted based upon whose perspective is telling it or teaching it. That's why I'm offended. Because oftentimes our history is told by those who do not know it and who did not experience it, nor are living in the reactions after it. And I believe that God wants us to have results. Anybody who's a teacher, we have several. If you teach, you know you teach for results. And the kind of teaching that God is urging us to do through ASAP, he wants us to, first of all, develop an intimate relationship with God through what is taught. He wants us to gain knowledge about God, and then he wants our lives to be transformed by what is taught. I don't teach here just to be teaching. I don't teach here just to impress with knowledge. I teach here for impact and influence so that we can live the life that God wants us to live. And I, like others, like the idea of family heirlooms. You know, that, that thing or those things that are valuable that has belonged to a family member somewhere in the past. It is tangible. It is meaningful to pass on to your children so, so it will give them a lasting uh, connection and memory of the previous person or generations. Things that are passed on that are family heirlooms and you don't want those to be in bad shape. You don't want them to be not working. You don't want them to be broken. You don't want them to be useless. You want them to be valuable in some kind of way that connects the present with the past. And the heirlooms of God's people are the words that are found in God's sayings, God's stories, and God's salvation. Those are the heirlooms that we are to pass down from generation to generation so that we will not forget what God has done and who God is is and it is our responsibility then as God's people to pass it along in what I would call our lived faith so that the other generations will see how faith walks not just spoken but how it walks how it is lived out in the workplace how it is lived out in your family how it is lived out in your marriage how it is lived out between child and parent how it is lived out in the world how it's lived out in how you do politics how you live it out in how you do community it is about how we live our faith not just speak about it that's part of the problem with these generations that are coming up. They are looking for the reality that what we say is what we do. And so then we want to pass along this lived faith in God through Jesus Christ, those of us who are Christian, because we know that this lived faith will never spoil, it will never rot, it will never fade, it will never break, it will never wear out, and it will never fall apart. We might fall apart, but faith won't fall apart. So here's the question for you. If we're going to intentionally teach God's sayings and stories and salvation, what are the heirlooms that you are leaving for the generations to come? What will they say has come from you, those who will never know you, who are coming after you. We must also intentionally tell God's sayings, God's stories, and God's salvation. Not just teach it, but we must tell it. And the psalmist knows that we cannot be God's people without telling, listen, and rehearsing the story of God's love, God's mercy, and God's patience with his people and passing on that story 
to the other generations. I'm wondering if some of us are too quiet about what the Lord done done. I wonder, I wonder if we have uh, received what God has done in the quietness of our lives and we have been unwilling to share because we might think somebody thinks we're trying to be too holy. No, 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 it's not about you. It's about God. And reciting the history of God's uh, relationship with his people and with you is a way to connect with future generations, what has happened in the past. It, it helps them to see how it flows to them, even though they are far removed from when the event occurred. By telling the history, they then can see how they fit in the family. What should we tell? The psalmist says, tell about God's praiseworthy deeds. What he's done that motivates you to praise him. What, 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 what about his power in your life? How when you were weak, how when you could not handle your challenges, you somehow got power from God? How, how, how do you tell them about the awe-inspiring, the wonder that something happened that you could not even imagine or think and figure out, but somehow you know it came from God. And you tell them, let me tell you what the Lord did for me. I, I didn't see it. I had to look backwards at it to see what God had done. But I'm absolutely certain that it had God's hand on it and God was the one who did it. And we also have to be willing to share with them that what you see now is not what has always been. You might see my glory, but you don't know my whole story. And when I tell my whole story, I have to admit that I have been disobedient, that I have fallen short of the glory of God. I have sinned in the presence of God. That's telling the whole story. And he tells us, when we tell the sayings and the stories and the salvation of God that we must be willing to tell both the good and the bad. We must tell them what God said. Here's a little book that I have on my shelf. It's called An Anthology of Black Folk Wit, Wisdom, and Sayings. It was compiled in an effort to tell those of us who no longer hear these sayings in our community. I heard them when we were segregated because it was being spoken in the space where I lived. But when we became uh, modern and integrated, we lost some of the wisdom and the sayings that we had in segregation because we didn't hear it anymore being spoken. But thanks be to God, the church is still available where we can hear people speak about what God has done and we can share some of the stories of our own people. We need to tell it. The good and the bad. Because that's the reality of who you are and why you are the way you are. That's why our story as a church that's told that dates back to 1924 has to talk about what happened over those 99 to 100 years that helped us to be who we are and why we are the way we are. That's why every church is different. Because every church is made up of different people who have had different experiences and every church has gone through different experiences itself. And you do things oftentimes in response and reaction to what has taken place there. That's why we have new member orientation because you cannot assume that the story of your new place is the same story of your old place. Tell every generation, the seniors must tell the middle-aged adults. The middle-aged adults must tell the young adults. The young adults must tell the teenagers. The teenagers must tell the younger children. The younger children must tell the children who cannot yet understand and those who will come up who are not yet born. That's what he says. It is passed down. And don't assume you have to be old like me before you start telling the story. 
Don't assume that because you are young that you don't have a story to tell about God. Don't assume that because you are old, you no longer have to tell the story. The old tell the adults. The adults tell the young adults. The young adults tell the teenagers. The teenagers tell the children. And the children tell those who are young but yet not able to understand and those who will be born while they are alive. This is how we tell it and keep it alive. And you start with God's story. Then you go into your story and share your story. You need to be willing if this is your story to say I've had some good days. I've had some hills to climb. I've had some weary days and some lonely nights but when I look around and I think things over all of my good days outweigh my bad days so what I won't complain I'm telling you a story you don't have to give them all the footnotes about what you really did just tell them he brought you through because there are those in our world, in our country, who are questioning whether or not God is real. That's why we have a category that sociologists refer to now as the nuns. Because they don't believe anything, not connected to the church. Many of whom did not grow up in church culture like some of us did. And they are foreign to the church. That's why we have to be sensitive that everybody who comes up in here does not already know something about God and the church. And so we have to orient them and help them and not be critical about them. Just accept that as their reality. Tell God's sayings, God's stories and the good and the bad. Last week. Baylor University's regents approved $6.3 million to fund a memorial to enslaved persons. It is an, a, going to be an addition to Baylor's Founders Mall there on the campus. It is Baylor's attempt to recognize the enslaved people who built Baylor's first campus in Independence, Texas. They are willing to acknowledge the bad part. And that's what we must do, not shy away. See, some of us who got some bad parts in our lives about how we used to live somehow are ashamed still and afraid to talk because these young folk, that's why some of us don't want to talk to the young folk. They'll ask you a direct question. Did you have sex before you got married? I'm not asking you to answer that. I don't want, it, I don't want everybody to stand. They, they would ask those kinds of questions, but we've got to be willing to tell them the good and the bad, bad because we ought to be planting seeds into their history. You all know Joanna uh, Gaines, HGTV's uh, fame, uh, fixer upper fame. She shared a great insight. She was talking about there's an Adonis blue butterfly bush that she planted by her daughter's window a few years ago when they were renovating their farmhouse. She wanted butterflies to come by the girls' windows so they could see the butterflies and enjoy them. She never told them about the bush, and she forgot about it over the years. One morning, she found her daughter sitting by her window. She was looking excitedly at the bush and she said to her mother, here she is. There was that little hummingbird. She says, it comes every morning. Mom, it comes every morning. First of all, Joanna didn't 
No, the daughter looked out the window every morning. <laughs> and second, she had forgotten about the bush and never told the daughter about the bush and never told her that I'm planting this because I expect you will see the prettiest little butterfly and hummingbirds gathered around it. Then she said this, you can sow seeds early, work hard to be intentional, and then over time you move to new lessons and new challenges. Then one day you look up and the seeds you planted are blooming. So, so keep planting. Let it be watered even if by Apollos or somebody else. And after it's planted and then it's watered, let God give the increase. See, we never know when we tell God's stories and God's sayings and his salvation, how that will be planted in the lives of our children so that when they grow up themselves and have their own growing experiences, that they will remember what you said about God and how God happened and, and was involved in your life. They might even remember some things that you say that might help them. Lest we forget, we must intentionally teach and tell God's sayings, God's stories, and God's salvation. And also, we must treasure them. Intentionally treasure God's saying, God's stories, and God's salvation. Don't just let them happen and you forget about it. Some of us need to go back when we're taking a bath or a shower. Look at our bodies and see the scars there. And remember how God brought you through whatever it was that scarred you. And now it is not just disfigurement on your body, but it is a memorial and a reminder of what God had done for you. When I look at my chest, I look at over here to my left, uh, remains of an incision. It reminds me of my pacemaker and then my defibrillator. When I keep looking and I look at the grown back slit in my middle of my chest, it reminds me of the transplanted heart. And I'm able to say, look what God has done. I, I treasure the marks on my body because it's a testimony to God. Here was God who chose a people for himself. But the people that he chose rejected him and they refused to give their hearts to God. That's what he says here in verse 8, that they refused to give their hearts to God. They were stubborn, they were rebellious, they were stiff-necked, they were faithless, they were disloyal, and their hearts wandered away from God as if they had forgotten what God had done for them. Lest we do that, we must remember and treasure what God has done, and transmitting our faith is an intangible treasure that will help the generations no matter how much schooling they get, no matter how much money they get. Letting them know about faith in God through Jesus Christ is what will get them through even when they're making seven figures. Because God has brought them through. You know, I'm trying to uh, finish this. Um, researchers have determined that every person's heartbeat is different. That every heartbeat has an identity. Earlier this year, the daughter of my transplanted heart donor called me 
she told me she was getting ready to get married. And she asked me if I would go and get the heartbeat of her father's heart in my body recorded. Because she wanted his heartbeat to play at the wedding ceremony. <laughs> I went to the, I called my transplant doctor, my transplant nurse, and I told her what I wanted to do. She arranged for me to go to the transplant center and they hooked me up just like they normally hook me up when they're checking my heart, just like giving a, a electrocardiogram, and they checked and hooked me up. They recorded the heartbeat. And then they took a photograph of it. The photo you see on the slide. The right one is a photograph of the heartbeat of the heart that is in my body. Because she wanted to hear her father's heartbeat. But when she heard it, was it her father's heartbeat or was it mine? Whose heartbeat are your children hearing? What is it that they will hear from your life? Are you transmitting to them sayings and stories? of how you grew up, how God brought you through, how God saved and delivered you. What, what is the heartbeat they are hearing? Do you not remember again? God said, if they teach, tell, and treasure his sayings, his stories, and his salvation, then they will not be like their ancestors. That's what we got to do is help save this next generation. Not be like the others that came before us, refusing to give their heart to God. God said through Ezekiel, I will give them an undivided heart. I will put a new spirit in them. I will move, remove from them their heart. And I will give them a heart of flesh. So God's people taught, told, treasured their history. And they told it and said once they were slaves in a foreign land. But God rescued them through plagues and hell and death. God pulled them out of their slavery. They told them that God brought them safely through the sea and into the wilderness. They told that story saying, but their people got thirsty in the desert. And because they got thirsty, they grumbled to God because they weren't satisfied. They told the story that so then God decided to split open a rock. And fresh water poured out of it. They told their story that then the people got hungry in the desert and they complained again about God. And so God rained down birds from the heaven. He gave them bread on the desert floor. But still they tell the story that they whined and they grumbled. But God still brought them to his holy mountain and he showed his glory and said, you cannot see my face, but watch the backside pass by. And soon they told the story that they decided to still get their own tame idol gods. That was their history. He told the story that no sooner did they repent and ask God for forgiveness that they turned again away from God. But God 
kept coming back and back again, kept coming back to them, finding ways to draw them to him, draw, finding ways to pull them back to him, finding ways to bring them into truth. And then God decided, I'm going to send my only begotten son on a death mission. So that he knows that when he gets there on heaven, he's not going to be there to live. He's going to be there to die. And so I'm glad about it that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's our story. And so what's your story? Lest you forget what the Lord done done for you. I have to say to him, I'm so glad that I remember what he's done for me. I won't forget the price that he paid for me. I won't forget that death was mine and he sent his son to take my place. I won't forget that he too made a sacrifice of himself. I won't forget that because of this love, I owe my whole life to him. I won't forget, Jesus, that you uh, set my soul free. I won't forget that you have brought me out and keep bringing me out. And so I'm singing and I'm teaching and I'm telling and I'm treasuring your sayings and your stories and your salvation because of what you have done for me. I, I can't forget what God has done for me, how he set my soul free. I can't forget how he brought me out. I can't forget so I must remember that you took my feet out of miry clay. I, I got to remember what what you've done for me. I got to tell somebody that you've been my friend. I got to tell somebody you've been my lawyer. I got to tell somebody you've been my doctor. I got to tell somebody you've been my light in the midst of darkness. I got to tell somebody what you've done for me. I got to tell somebody you've lifted my heavy burdens. I got to tell somebody you've always come through for me. I got to tell somebody that you have walked with me and talked with me and tell me what I am. I I have to tell somebody you've been my water when I was thirsty. I have to tell somebody not only were you my food but you were my buffet when I needed something to eat. And because of that, lest I forget I'm going to tell him you've been a good God. You've been a mighty God. You've been a wonderful God. You've shown yourself out and shown yourself up. Because of what you have done for me.